So this is Charmaine, everyone. You're going to share your story. All right. All right. Um, yeah, yeah. So thank you so much for having me. Um, and thank everybody for joining us. Um, such a great platform and a great opportunity to learn uh, more about kidney, you know, kidney disease and all that. Anyway, um, so uh, so my kidney journey started when I was very young, when I was two. And um, it was from problems with my ureters backing up and all that. And then um, it went on for about 10 years. And then uh, I got surgery to get it fixed. And you know, moving forward now in about 20 years, um, my GFR was about 20%. And, uh, and then in my thirties, it started declining. Uh, so eventually, obviously I started, um, I started on in-center dialysis and I was at about gosh, five, 5%, I think before I, you know, for my doctors kind of told me that it was, it was time. And so, uh, so I dialyzed for about seven months and then I transplanted uh, the first time. And I was really happy to be off dialysis. The first transplant lasted about three years. And then, um, and then it, it went into rejection and I went back on dialysis to in center. And, um, about six months from there, I went to switched over to peritoneal dialysis. And I did that for about three years. And I was just, it was life changing for me to do the peritoneal dialysis. I did that, like I said, for three years, and I transplanted again in on July fourth of two thousand and three, and this year will be eighteen years, still going strong. So, um, in two thousand fourteen, my social worker at the dialysis clinic, um, you know, I was talking to him about giving back, and he had mentioned Remend, and so I called and uh, and came in to visit and all that, and really fell in love with the program, and I've been a part of it ever since. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing your story. Um, and that's what, you know, Remand is all about. Um, you know, just sharing your experience will, you know, makes people comfortable and, and wanting to share their own experience. So thank you so much, Charmaine. I really yeah, appreciate it. You're welcome. It. Thank you guys so much for having me. I'm so happy to be here and a part of it. Awesome. Okay. Now we're going to go into, so now you know a little bit about Remand, but you know, Maybe you want to participate. Maybe you want to be a part of Remand. Well, here are a couple of ways that you can do that as soon as it pops up. You can connect with us if you feel like you need a mentor. Please visit us at remand.org. Um, there's a page on there, and all you have to do is uh, send us a little bit of information, and we'll, we'll reach out to you. If you're interested in actually becoming a mentor, perhaps maybe you have experienced kidney disease as a patient and, or you're a loved one or a caregiver, you know, connect with us. You know, let's talk about it. Let's see. Maybe that might be a great thing for you. Um, another way of reaching out and, and giving to the community. Or, you know, you could simply donate. Um, donate what you can. Every little bit helps our tiny organization. We're very small, um, but we're growing. So um, in turn, if you make a donation, we'll be able to help more people along their kidney journey. Um, and continue to leave fulfilling lives because receiving a diagnosis of chronic kidney disease or end-stage renal disease um, isn't, uh, you know, you can still live a, a wonderful, fulfilling life. And that's what all of our mentors are here to talk about. Um, but today, let's see here, what do we have next? Well, we're here for the big show, which is making the right choice, your dialysis treatment options. And we have some fantastic guests. Uh, Cynthia Polis is a care management nurse with Balboa Nephrology Medical Group. And then we also have Dr. Steven Steinberg, who's retired CEO and medical director of Balboa Nephrology Medical Group. And he happens to be a co-founder of Remend. I mean, what more could we ask for here? Um, so let me see if I can bring them on here. It would be great if I could do that. Here we go, Cindy. There she is. <laughs> Hello. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Thank you for joining us today. Um, we're super excited about launching this. Uh, we really want this to be an opportunity for you guys to have some dialogue, to engage, to prepare, to be your advocate. So this is all about you guys um, and your kidney journey. And we are just here to be your cheerleaders, okay? We are here to cheer you on, give you the support. Um, I'm here as an educator. I work with patients 
with uh, kidney disease, end stage renal failure. So this is what I love to do. Um, I love to educate. I love to help. I love to help people teach. Um, I hope you guys can all hear us now. <laughs> so um, again, you know, we have this open for you guys to have this opportunity to really engage and, and ask some good questions. And Dr. Steinberg's here as a, a participant, which we feel extremely lucky. Yes. Because sure. he's going to have all the right answers <laughs> and really be a good participant. And so here we have Dr. Steinberg. And hello, Dr. Steinberg. Hi. Well, great. I'm also happy to be here. I found that, um, you know, it's a complicated um, business with kidney disease. You need more than an office visit or, um, you know, a, a small talk with your physician. It take, because it's, it's complicated, you need to do some learning and most patients need some help. Um, so I'm happy to see if I can help. I was a physician for 50 years, 40 years with Balboa. I'm basically a transplant nephrologist. So I'm very interested in transplant and I'm really here to see if I can lend some help to a really, really, I think, very important organization, um, an organization of, you know, patients helping other patients with their life experiences and the course of, that they have through renal disease. And, um, you know, for me, at, at my, being retired and at my age, I'm more worried about the technical aspects of doing this than anything about <laughs> the facts. So bear with well. us in just in case. Yes, yeah. that's true. Thank you so much for saying that, Dr. Steinberg. Um, you guys can still hear me, right? <laughs> yes. Okay, All perfect. Good. Okay, so let's move on. We've got um, some slides here for everyone to see. I'm going to, uh, let's see. Can we go, to, would you like to go to my slides? Here we go. First. Oh, sure. Um, we're going to have, um, Cindy's going to just first talk about oh, why yes. um, kidneys are so important. Okay. Hi guys. So I think most of you kind of know already a little bit how your kidneys are working and why they're so important. But you know, your kidneys are one of the most important organs in your entire body and people don't really pay attention to your kidneys. I think so much until there's a problem. Um, your kidneys remove your waste products from the body, all those toxins, all those wastes. Um, if they don't have those little nephrons doing their little jobs properly, then all that toxin starts to build up and back up. And that's really what we're trying to prevent. Uh, your kidneys are balancing all your bodily fluids, your electrolytes, all that calcium, all that potassium, um, all the really good minerals that they're supposed to absorb. So your kidneys are critical. Um, and finally, you know, they really help that drug clearance. So we really want to be aware of all the over-the-counter medications we're taking, um, especially the ones that are somewhat harmful to our kidneys. That could be some sort of anti-inflammatory. So uh, we, we have so much to share with you, and we're so happy that you guys are here to listen. So hopefully this is helpful, and we're excited about you guys engaging. Awesome. So now, Dr. Steinberg, can you tell us about making the right choice? Sure. Um, you know, in the past, both you and myself, if you uh, went to the doctor, uh, most of your care was directed. You'll need an appointment in three to four months. Um, get these labs. You'll need this x-ray. Um, it was really more of a, a passive experience in which the healthcare team determined what you had to do and then offered you um, uh, minimal choices um, and the main thing you expected from them is explanation of why they had come to that conclusion but you know it's different with kidney disease it's different because you're going to be asked to decide the decision you make will affect and direct your care your care will be an active partnership with your health care team I hope you'll be open to this concept of remand. I hope you'll ask for help. I hope that you can find a mentor here who will guide you and or a mentor too that will tell you what they did and help you navigate um, through through this um, through this um, through this course. Um, there are several choices um, and that um, you'll, You'll hear about them many times. Um, 
the, and you and your family and friends need to be aware and, and expect opportunities to learn. And you need to seek as much information and learning as you can. I also know that there are barriers and disparities um, to this process. For some of you, it will be harder to decide. Some of you, it'll be harder to carry out your decision. Some of you will have limited resources, lack of transportation, insurance problems, problems with language and culture. It's going to make your journey more difficult. And that's where Remen can help. And that's where a mentor can help. I hope you'll be open to this process so that we can help you get um, the care you, you deserve and, and, and basically make the right choices um, so that you can, so that we can bring you back to health as much, as much as possible. So it's different. You're going to be making choices. We know there's barriers and that's why we have a remand. Thank now. you so much. That's awesome. Let me um, move on to this next screen so people can follow what you're saying here Thank about you. the different Thank you uh, very much. options. You know, because I could keep talking forever. <laughs> That's why I cut in. <laughs> um, the choices, there's just a bunch of choices as you can for kidney, uh, your kidney care. This is a brief outline. Cindy's going to go over so much of this in great detail, not just here, but all the other people in it, it, that you're going to meet in the team will also go over this again. But here's a brief outline to set the stage. Um, first choice, no care. Um, I know that sounds ridiculous, but it's not. Many patients who are very older, sicker, in pain, conservative management, comfort management, with or without hospice, is really the best choice. We know that. We're not anxious to have you do anything you don't want to do. We only want you to make a choice and make the right choice. In-center dialysis is the most common form of dialysis that patients are on four, to in four times for the treatment, three times a week in a center, usually in your neighborhood. Um, this is probably the fallback position for many people. It may not be the best choice, however. For some, and Cindy will go over this, home dialysis is really the best choice, um, not just for medical reasons, but for convenience. And I want to assure everybody, although it sounds crazy, I'm going to do this dialysis in my home? What? No, it's very doable. And, it's, and, and the staff will show how to do this. And I really hope that you look into this option um, and don't just dismiss this because oh, I don't know anything about medicine or I, you know, I don't have the education or it's scary. Please consider home dialysis. Now, the next three choices are in transplant. And I always feel that transplant is that's the best treatment if you can get a transplant. And what's the problem with transplant? You need to get a kidney. So these three types of transplants are, are about getting a kidney. If you don't have a friend or a family member or anyone who can give you a kidney, you'd have to go on to a transplant list for a deceased donor. Um, and what's the problem with waiting for a deceased donor? The list is long because there's not enough kidneys and you may be waiting eight to 10 years you may be waiting eight to 10 years on dialysis for the transplant. So living donor in which you ask somebody in your family, child, parent, sibling, cousin, uncle, aunt, how about a friend? How about somebody at church? Sometimes somebody will just if they hear your story, they'll come up and give you a kidney. Living donor transplant can be done in a much shorter time. It's an elective procedure, and usually you can expect that within months, we can work up a living donor transplant, but you've got to make that choice. You've got to talk to people, and you've got to, um, and you've got to move this forward. Preemptive transplant, that's um, 
I often feel that's the best. You just start off with the transplant. You never get sick. You never go on dialysis. But to do this, you're going to have to get started. You're going to have to be assertive. You're going to have to talk to your potential donor early. And you're going to have to tell the medical team that um, I don't want to wait around and I want to get my transplant as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. So that's the outline. Um, you're going to hear a lot more about all the choices. Um, you're going to forget a lot of the things you heard you hear today and that the people tell you in the office. So you're going to have to ask again. But don't forget, um, we're, we're here to help. That's the whole purpose of this. But we want you not to ask what you should do from the doctor or the nurse. We want you to think about what's right for you. There are choices, and they're right over there on that screen, and we'd like you to make the right choice. And I think I'll, I'll stop there. Okay. Thank you so much. We're going to uh, now, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Steinberg, for giving us the outline. Um, we're also um, going to invite Cindy, as he mentioned, to talk about the options, exactly what um, they mean, and go into greater detail. Uh, let's see. Here we go. Hello. Thanks again, you guys. Um, so conservative management, what is conservative management? Um, this, this kind of, it, it, it's more of a comfort care. Conservative management is not any kind of hospice typically. It's, we try to drive it as a comfort care. So, you know, there's no guarantee on, um, there's no way of really knowing the longevity if your kidney is going to have you know, another six months, or it's going to have four months, or it's going to have another two years or three years when you decide this. So for most people, uh, or some people, conservative management is good if they are a little bit older, they're just not prepared or ready to really take on dialysis or transplant. They just want to have that quality of life. Uh, they just want to be with their family towards the end. They just want to be able to travel, have the freedom, um, and you will be taken care of. Not, nobody's going to leave you alone. There's going to be a team of medical professions. There's going to be a social worker. You're going to be visiting with a physician, and you're going to be comfortable. And comfort and conservative management really. Okay, and I want to just stop you right there. I think we're having some issues with people aren't able to hear right now. Okay, can everyone hear us now? Let's see. We've got some people saying they couldn't hear. Lost sound. Okay, they lost sound. One moment, please. Oops, we don't want that. Okay, well, let's get let's um, move on and see if people respond to this. So, our next slide is about home dialysis choices. Home dialysis choices. Okay, it looks like we're good. We're back on, just in time for home dialysis. <laughs> okay, guys. So this is really when I want everybody to kind of engage a little bit. If there's questions, you know, ask the questions on in the chat box. This is. 
an opportunity for you guys. Um, this is not a presentation. This is a conversation. So as we're kind of going through this and we have Dr. Steinberg online, come on, let's get those hard questions. What, what are some of the barriers? You know, what are you guys, what's coming into your minds when you think of peritoneal dialysis? Is it, uh, okay, we're back. Is it a fistula in my stomach? No, it's not a fistula in your stomach. Peritoneal dialysis is simply a, a catheter, very small, fine, flexible little catheter that will be placed in your lower pelvic cavity. And then that's where it will be doing the slow, gradual exchanges. And it works natural, like almost like an artificial kidney. Um, and the best part about peritoneal dialysis is that it will help pre preserve the residual kidney function. So if you are that person waiting for a transplant, this would be kind of more the ideal choice for you. And mostly, this is home. You know, you get to do this in the comfort of your home while you're sleeping. Um, you're never alone while you do this. Um, you're going to have a team to support you. You're going to have the training to support you. You're going to have a 24-7 line. Um, the technology today for peritoneal dialysis is amazing. You're going to have a small little system next to your bed. You're going to have a very quiet system now um, than before, and they keep graduating to better uh, quality as we move on. And then the next one is the home hemodialysis. This is also a, a good opportunity for you to be home and be well at home with your family. Um, so the home hemodialysis, the access is a fistula, um, but you can still have the flexibility of being with your family, doing this by yourself, having the independence, having a job, having a career. Um, you have the flexibility of doing this treatment during the day or during the evening. So if anybody has any conversations they'd like to engage in the new default of dialysis, please send in your your questions. This is when you need to ask. This is when we have the support to answer those hard questions. And you know um, what, Cindy, we have yeah. you know, both um, Charmaine and myself. Um, I've been on uh, peritoneal dialysis. Um, I was on um, parent PD for four years and it was definitely the right choice for me. I mean, I was able to travel, um, and Absolutely. you know, I wasn't stuck to a chair for, you know, three times, three to four times a week. Um, right. so PD was an excellent choice, even though in the beginning I, I was scared, I was scared because I didn't know about it. I didn't know how it worked. And so, you right. know, it's all about education and that's exactly what we're here to Absolutely. do. And, and Charmaine, do you want to share, um, because she was also, uh, let me see. She was also, here she is, on PD. There she is. I like, I like that little countdown that it gives me. <laughs> <laughs> little builder. Um, yeah, I, thanks for adding me to the conversation there. Because um, I, I definitely wanted to, to just, just something that was just so important to me uh, with PD is that, um, you know, is that it, it just, I felt like it was more natural um, for me because, you know, our kidneys work every day and people think like, oh my gosh, I got to dialyze every day, but it's, it's so gentle. And I would just hook up at night when I go, when I sleep. So I'm not doing anything anyway. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, and the other thing is that um, because you're dialyzing every day, you know, I was able to, you know, I mean, everybody's different, of course, but for myself, I was able to replenish um, some of the nutrients that my body needs just to, you know, kind of rebuild itself, if you will, or recover, you know, from various things. Cause I was very active, um, you know, while I was, you know, on dialysis and still, so, you know, you have that fluid restriction on in center and which I was horrible at doing, um, why my doctor's not on here today, <laughs> um, but, um, but anyway, so it's, it's, um, yeah, it, for me, uh, like Kiku, it was just definitely such a great choice. And I'm such a huge proponent of it because I didn't have any medical training either. And it was just, um, you know, it takes time to learn just like anything. And, um, you know, and I, I just like to tell people to just be patient with the process because it is something new. And, um, for me, it took about two months to really kind of get into the groove, into the flow mm -hmm. of, of, um, you know, my routine and stuff like that. Right. right. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Yeah, hey, you're welcome. I, I have a question here. Um, Vicki wants to know what happens if you have no one and something goes wrong with the home hemo? 
What do you guys, what do you think about that, Cindy? So there's two things. One, if it's a problem with maybe the electricity or the support, when you are training for peritoneal dialysis, they're going to teach you how to do a manual exchange. So let's just say your machine's not working right or something, all of a sudden it shuts down. Um, you will be taught how to do a manual exchange. A manual exchange is when you have a bag, the gravity bag, you're going to have a bag up, the solution bag up on top. You're going to be connected with your catheter and then you're going to have the exchange down below so that the gravity is going to flow and have its natural exchanges. Um, so you will also be using this type of manual exchange if you want to go camping, uh, you want to have a sleepover, you don't want to take your machine, it's just going to be for a few nights. Um, and the other thing is when you decide on peritoneal dialysis, you're going to have a team, a support team. And that support team is available 24-7. So if you need some help troubleshooting, um, there's always going to be somebody there to support you. There's going to be numbers. There's going to be a team. There's going to be a nurse. So, Vicki, I hope that that answers the question. Awesome. Thank you for that. Here, I'm going to uh, bring up the next. Transplantation. This, this might be something for... Uh, Dr. Steinberg here as well. Let me bring him in the conversation. There he is. I haven't gone away. <laughs> <laughs> well, here you are. We're going to talk about uh, kidney transplantation. And um, so I, I think if you can, and if you can get a, a kidney, I mean, I think this is, the, this is um, if you're able and you're healthy enough, uh, kidney transplant is really the way way to go for many patients. I think the thing is it is about getting the kidney. If you don't have somebody that can donate a kidney for you, and you're going to be on a list um, with other patients waiting, the waiting time can be eight to ten years, and that's a long time to be on uh, dialysis waiting for a transplant. Also, remember if you're going on dialysis in your 60s and 70s, 10 years will make you much older. And at that time, you may not be um, healthy enough for a transplant. But there's many people will talk about a transplant. And um, although it's surgeries involved, it's not complicated surgery. And although you have to take medicines, it's not um, side effects have been greatly reduced and success rates for living donors are over 95%. So start thinking now about talking to your family and your friends and people at church or people at work and tell them that you have kidney disease and see what they say. Many people will come forward, even strangers, to, to give kidneys for people at need. This wouldn't be a good time to get mad at anyone in your family. So. <laughs> Keep your friends. <laughs> yeah. So now we've got uh, Cindy back. Would you like to add a little something? Um, I don't know. I just kind of want to hear from our audience. You know, I want to hear some questions about transplant, about living donors. Um, what are the, some of the concerns? You know, uh, I know sometimes people have a hard time asking for a kidney. Uh, I know, you know, personally, we've I've had an experience with that with a family member, and it's uncomfortable. Um, mm -hmm. um, so I think maybe what we're learning today is to use our tools uh, to ask for a kidney. And what are those tools? Those tools are social media. Um, we connect with different social media Facebook groups and get involved with those tools. And let's start sharing your story. Let's mm -hmm. start talking about what happened to you because everybody has a personal story and that will impact other people differently. Um, and, and it does work. You know, you advocate for yourself and you share a story and you champion for yourself mm -hmm. um, and really put together some resources and make a story and make people feel somewhat of a connection to you and your journey. And that will bring and reciprocate, uh, I think, some good feedback. And it does work. People come together. People want to donate a kidney when they hear your story. So... I think that's kind of what really we're, we're focusing in today is the social media platform. I mean, they didn't have this 10 years ago, 15 years right. ago, to really explore that opportunity. So use it to your advantage today. Um, so 
I have a um, I, I, comment I, I, from uh, somebody that you guys may know. It's a comment from a guy named Dennis Bork. You guys know him, okay. right? Oh yes. <laughs> um, hi, Dennis. I, uh, hi, Dennis. <laughs> so let me uh, let me uh, can I answer that? Yes, I think please. This is, you know, once you you know it's surgery, but the really complicated part about a transplant is taking the medicines. And one of the things we find um, after you, you get through the hurdle of making sure you have a dialogue with people who will give you a kidney is, well, I've had a surgery now and uh, it's working. Um, maybe I don't need these medicines. Uh, but it's not like having your gallbladder out or having a, um, an orthopedic procedure. You have to take the medicines continuously. And if you're having trouble, and if you're going through a bad period of life, time of your life and you're depressed and just can't get it or, you know, don't want to take the medicines or you lose your insurance, this is a really good time to talk to the team. And this is a really good time to talk to a mentor. I think yes. somebody at Remen can help you. There's patients there that had trouble taking their medicine that continue to take their medicine and adhering to the medicine. And I think a program in addition to your regular team, of somebody who's really gone through this and has had to take medicines for one, two, 15, 20, some patients, 30, 40 years, can help you adhere. You need to keep taking your medicine. And if you're just feeling blue and unable to do this or going through a really down period or lost your insurance, um, you need to talk, talk to us. And um, I, I think mentors are great for that. And I, I included you, Charmaine, without you telling, sorry. But um, I thought maybe you could share a little bit about um, taking your medications. I mean, I could also talk, speak to that. My husband has to remind me, well, he doesn't have to, but he does remind me every day, twice a day, did you take your medicine? So, you know, how, how did you, how do you cope with that? Yeah, it's, it's um, some people think like, oh, what's the big deal, you know, taking medication. And, and I've actually been on the same um, cocktail um, for the whole, basically the whole time. So all 18 years. And I mean, there's been like little tweaks here and there, but for the most part, it's been all the same. And it's just uh, three medications, two I take twice a day and one I take one, once in the morning. Mm -hmm. And basically what I do is I have uh, alarms on my phone <laughs> that, I, that I set and then uh, for eight and eight eight in the morning, eight at night. And then I also have a routine that I started in the morning as well, um, is that I put all my, get all my meds together uh, for the week. I have like a little, you know, a seven day medication um, tray, which I didn't want to get, but I, but I did because I'm getting older and I'm forgetful. Um, so I put all my meds in there. And then uh, in the morning, what I do is that I get up and I put my phone like right next to the dresser and as, I, as soon as I do that, I, I take my meds out, the tray out and I put them down um, because, and I leave my phone with the tray um, because um, eventually my alarm will go off and then I'll go and I'll grab, grab my phone and then I'll, I'll grab the meds as well. So that way I'm, I just, I don't forget, right. um, especially in the morning. So cause the morning's hectic and you know, you're rushing around and all that kind of stuff with all, the things that you have to do. So um, morning time is a little bit more challenging for me. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, it's just, it's so critical to, to not miss. Right. So, right. yeah. Um, let me bring our folks back on here because we have a question from, let's see, Art has a question. Um, there's a lot of feedback from somebody here. It might be not quite sure. So Art's question is, uh, the caregiver is an important part of the process. Let's just show his question. Um, Eileen, I'm assuming is his wife, had her first transplant in 1970, her second in 2007. Both highly successful, especially with the help of Dr. Steinberg. Thank you. Yay. Thank Thanks, you, Art. Art. And sa say hi to Mrs. Ferber for me. Awesome. Okay, so let me bring this slide back up. Is our, We still need to touch on the last point that was on here. Uh, and that was preemptive transplant. Who would like to speak on that? Cindy? 
Uh, I would like Dr. Steinberg. I think that he's probably be better at discussing preemptive transplant. He's been I, doing I this. Think, I think. Oh, fine. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I think you know. I think preemptive transplant is like you know. It's it's like the uh, Rolls Royce of treatment options. Um, if if no care is the easiest, you know and in center dialysis. Preemptive transplant is the most complicated because basically what you're saying is, I found out I have kidney disease. I don't want any of these other options. Um, I want a transplant and I want it right away. Mm -hmm. And actually, we're starting to think that this this is, we can do this and, the, and we're being encouraged by uh, the government to try and do this and avoid the, the fistula or the catheter or the time in the dialysis unit or the, uh, you know, the long wait. But you have to have somebody in mind and you have to talk to them. Opening the dialogue for is the most important thing for a preemptive transplant. Mm -hmm. you, you can't wait and then when you're told that you'll need um, some treatment, um, some type of dialysis, then say, you know what, I want a transplant, and I think I'll call my brother. I haven't talked to him in 30 years. I, we had a big fist fight at Thanksgiving dinner, and I haven't talked to him, but he'll give me a kidney. No, that's not going to work. You need a dialogue. You want a preemptive transplant? That means right away, It mean, why you still don't even need dialysis, then you need to be talking to your doctor and a mentor, and, and you'll have to be, it's imperative that you go to your appointments, you make sure they're not in three months, but they're in one month, you talk to your donor, you get everything, you get everything ready. Um, living donation transplant is still, I think, you know, a really, really good choice. But the most important thing is if you just sit back and don't talk to anybody and you don't ask the difficult question, I need some help. Very hard mm -hmm. for people to ask for help. I need some help. Will you help me? Uh, things won't happen, and that's why we need your cooperation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's why we need to educate. You know, people need to know that they can ask that question. We can ask people to be their champion, their hero. Um, we're going to open up to questions from everyone here. Um, I, I would I'd like to say one more thing. Okay. It's nice to listen to me. But it's, I think it's better to listen to somebody who's been through this. Um, oh, boy. You know, I, I really do think that that's where <laughs> remand and mentoring come through. I think talking to people who've experienced dialysis and transplant um, for years uh, will both actually make you feel better and give you courage and will inspire you. Uh, and, and I think as much as I could talk and talk and talk, talk to somebody who's been through this and it's, it'll be very reassuring. And we actually have people that can help you start the dialogue in your family to talk to somebody to get a kidney. So don't forget about Remit. Thank you for that. Um, we, we do have a couple of questions here. Um, does a person's GFR matter? And what is GFR? Who, who wants to go with that question? Cindy, can you explain GFR? I would think Dr. Steinberg should explain uh, that's GFR. That's basically the way. <laughs> uh, high level, but this okay. is why. Okay. There's many ways to measure kidney function, and one of them is GFR or glomerular filtration rate. Um, it's the most accurate way of doing it, but most of the people in healthcare will be using your serum creatinine or maybe a creatinine clearance or a calculated cracking clearance. I think what we want to do is give you your treatment when you need your treatment, not too soon. That would be, you know, that would be a problem. But the biggest problem is giving you your treatment too late. Yeah. So your healthcare team will be following your creatinine, which is an indirect measure of glomerular filtration rate. Um, and um, and it's how it's determined. So there's a lot of different ways, some of which are controversial. But the main thing for you is to be constantly monitored to get the dialysis mm -hmm. and, or the kidney transplant, whatever works best and whatever you choose, 
at the right time. Monitoring and getting labs is very important. And when you have a transplant, you're gonna net, get, net, have to get labs too to make sure that everything's working well. And that um, if you do need any extra treatment or change in treatment, it's done in a, it's done in a timely manner. Right. Thank I you. Hope that's sufficient. It was a great answer. I, I have another question. Um, can you address the possibility of different success rates of tissue matching? Also, the progress made in handling side effects of medication. I guess it's me again. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, there's so many, you know. So I would say. Um, <laughs> That the side, as far as the side effects of the medications, there are side effects. We try to minimize them. Um, a lot of a lot of these are allergies to the medicines, side effects of medicine, such as um, sometimes hair growth. Um, and we have all sorts of ways to minimize this and work with this. Because remember, you're going to go to the physician, and you're going to tell she, him or her, "Look, I have this problem," and they will adjust your medicine or change your medicine and take care of this. Tissue typing is very important, but it's not as important as it used to be. Um, mm -hmm. I would say because mm -hmm. the medicine is so much better, if you can't give a person a transfusion, you can't give them a kidney. But outside of that, it's not, oh, I didn't match, or I was no good for this, or I think there's so many really good uh, medications that Matching is important, but not as important as before. And we have paired exchange, which you'll learn about. Uh, it's probably beyond this talk. But I wouldn't worry about the match as much as had showing up at the transplant center. I've got a donor. And they'll worry about whether that donor is good for you. And they'll worry if that donor is not good for you of exchanging that donor with somebody else who doesn't have a good donor. And this has been available the last few years because of new software. So it's not, talk to people. That's your job. Talk to people and tell them your story. Tell them that you're going to need a kidney. And if you get to the transplant center with the donor, that's their problem. Your problem is to talk and, and tell people about this. And if you don't know how to do that, have a mentor show you. And you know, I'm going to ask a question of everyone. Um, show this. If you're currently using InCenter, uh, what are your biggest challenges or complaints? Are there folks on? Because I know that we have a few people here. What if you, maybe you are already on InCenter Hemo, maybe you're not even on it anymore, but what are some of the things that you remember as being challenges, um, things that you just really hated about it? <laughs> we we want to know. Um, let's see. Anyone? GFR is a big... Uh, topic. Um, could you talk about, um, let's see, if your GFR goes from, you know, one high level from 15 to 10 in just a few weeks, could it be your AKI? Can you explain what that question is all about? Well, Dr. I didn't Steinberg. ask the question, but I'll try. <laughs> um, I think, I, I, yeah, you know, things happen. You know, you're seeing your team and things are happening. So you might have 15, but then you um, you get sick. Um, you get COVID-19. Mm. I hope that doesn't happen to anybody. Mm. Right. Um, you take a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug like Motrin. Um, you get dehydrated because you have diarrhea. And it could drop acutely. And that's known as acute kidney injury. That's reversible. Mm -hmm. So when that happens, the team has to figure out why did it go from 15 to 10 and see if there's something reversible that they can do to get you back to 15. If indeed it did go to 10, um, that's really when you want it. We have to start planning. We should start planning before. But the point is don't plan till it gets to five. Um, mm -hmm. There's. It's very important that, you know, you don't get put on dialysis because you have something that's reversible, like you can go back to 15 to 20. But let me tell you something. The worst thing that I've seen in 40 years of being a nephrologist is starting too late. 
Because mm. the trick here, the science here, the art here is for you not to get too sick and is to give you a treatment modality that will work for you and, and so that you don't get to the point where you're having really kidney failure or uremia. We, we need to treat you before that. And that's why education is really so important. You can't really, uh, I hate this. Look, nobody wanted to get kidney disease. It's not like we're handing anything out free or, or, or a prize. So nobody really wants to ha have this. So there's a lot of patients will just say, I, I, you know, whenever it happens, it happens. I don't want to think about it. But actually, you should think about it. And especially if you're interested in transplant or preemptive transplant, I'd start thinking about it early. Thank you. Um, you know, also we have um, a question about fluid management. Why is that so important? Um, why? Okay. Well, I why could, is Cindy, you want to do that one or you would like me to take it? <laughs> yeah. Come on, no, Cindy. You All go. right. Let's, so, you're the expert. Let's hear it from the expert. Okay. There's two. Okay. Fluid management is important. Um, it's first because if you, if you don't watch your fluid, um, and remember your kidney used to get rid of the excess fluid, it's going to build up and it's not just going to make you uncomfortable because you're going to have swelling, but it's also going to make your heart work harder. So fluid management is really important because when you used to drink a lot of fluids, you used to urinate a lot. Now if you drink a lot of fluids, it goes into your lungs or your ankles and it makes your heart work harder. The most important thing for you is not, don't worry about the dialysis machine or the medicines. You've got a job to do, and that's to keep yourself healthy. Especially if you're going to wait for a transplant for 10 years, you've got to maintain your health and keep yourself healthy. And that means taking care of your blood pressure, taking care of your diabetes, and taking care of your fluid management. It's very, very important uh, that you do that. Fluid management is difficult. It's easy for me to say. That's why I think a mentor is better. I've never had to have oh. fluid management. I think a patient who's had to suffer through this, restrict their fluids, can give you more insights uh, than, I, than, uh, than, I, than I can. But well, ask and you shall receive. Here's a mentor, Miss Charmaine. Charmaine is going to share. <laughs> yeah, I just, I just wanted to comment a little bit because um, when I was in, in center, um, you know, fluid management was just such a challenge for me. And, you know, thinking back on it, <clears throat> um, you know, I, I believe that if I knew a little bit more, um, you know, I would have been able to, I guess, you know, control that a little bit, uh, a little bit better. Um, and the, the reason I say that is because I would come into clinic, especially if I'm dialyzing on a, a Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and I leave on Friday and I come back on Monday and, you know, I'm not containing my fluid and fluid means so many things, not just water or liquid, but even, you know, if, if you're eating jello or you're eating, you know, anything that can liquefy. Um, and so, you know, I would come back just swollen. And what happens is that, you know, they have to pull so much off of you when, when you're, when you're in that kind of shape and it just, oh my goodness, like the recovery time for me, when I would be over, um, you know, four or five kilos, which is a considerable amount of water weight, um, I just would be, I'd be cooked for the rest of the day and, and even the next day. And so, um, so it just made my treatment a lot harder um, than I guess it, it, I made it a lot harder for myself, I guess, because of, of really of non-compliance and really just not really that much education back, back when I was doing it 20 years ago. So, um, so yeah, so I just wanted to comment on that just from a patient's perspective and what that does, you know, just that if you don't contain your fluid, then, you know, you're just, your treatments are going to be that much harder. And, and that's yeah. the reason why we meant that a mentor is better. That's a much better answer than myself. <laughs> Um, and it's much more feeling and a actual participating answer. Uh, there's some things about this that, you know, talking to somebody who's had the experience and had the treatment and had the restriction and the regulation and the suffering 
is better. And that's why you should really reach out to have somebody help you with this if you need it. Right. Thank yeah, you. And I, if, if I can just kind of circle back to that, that that's why I, one of the reasons that I really loved PD as well is because my fluid restrictions were much less mm -hmm. um, because I was pulling, you know, that fluid off every night while I slept. And so it just made it, um, it just made life a lot. My quality of life definitely increased just because of that. Well, I want to thank all of you um, for participating. Um, I know we have more questions, um, but you know what? We're going to have another one of these. We're going to have another talk. And I promise, I promise we'll be a little bit uh, better on the whole transitioning here. But um, I want to thank Dr. Steinberg and Cindy and Charmaine for participating. Um, we want to know what you want to talk about. I know it's kind of quiet this morning, but you know, we're prepared to answer any questions you may have. And you can also visit our website um, at remen.org um, and reach out to us if you have questions that we weren't able to answer today. Um, you can email us, you can um, you know, ask questions on our Facebook page. We're just happy that you're here taking time to um, educate yourself about uh, kidney disease and dialysis. So thank you all so much. Look at it's almost like 11 o'clock. We're running on time. I can't even believe it. There's someone, Vicky has a, Vicki, thank you for participating. I appreciate it. Dennis, Art, Daniel's here too. Awesome. Thank you all so much. And now we're going to play. I know Dr. Steinberg loves this music, so I'm going to play it. No, and, no, please. Come on, you love it. There it is. Thank you all so much. Okay, thank See you. See you guys. Bye-bye.